While there may be thousands of Valerian steel blades in the world, weapons of immense quality infused with magic and spells created by the Valerians, according to Maesters, there are only about 227 in Westeros. Despite that, we only know about around a dozen houses in the Seven Kingdoms that possess a Valerian steel sword as a family heirloom. A family heirloom that means a lot to them, as their quality, cost, and the amount that are in the world make them a true rarity. These heirlooms mean so much to a family and have so much status behind them, a family may be offered a ridiculous amount of gold for it and still refuse to part with the item. We know at one point that House Lannister had their very own Valyrian steel sword. However, like a few other houses, the Lannisters had the bad luck of losing possession of their sword. So this video, let's take a look at House Lannister's family Valerian sword, Bright Roar, its history and theory surrounding it. According to legend, Lan the Clever, by debatable means, took over Casterly Rock, making House Casterly extinct in the process, in the Age of Heroes, some 10,000 years before the books begin. After he founded House Lannister of Casterly Rock, his descendants, Kings of the Rock, began to slowly gain control of the Westerlands. As time marched on, they obtained more and more territory. Yet despite having vast power and wealth from their mines, the Lannisters acquired their Valerian sword much later than some other houses. Though in fairness, we do know some of the houses got their swords around the time of the Lannisters. So it isn't like they were a huge exception. For the Lannisters though, it wasn't until around 200 BC, well after they had taken control of the Westerlands, that they were able to purchase one from the Valerians. And while again, they weren't the only ones that got a sword so late in the game, it is still thousands of years after some houses already had theirs. And we know with the Lannister pride, they would have wanted their own showboat sword. So if they had the means to get one sooner, why did it take so long to get their own Valerian steel sword? Well, there may actually be a pretty direct answer to why they got theirs much later than some other houses. To answer the question, let's take a look at the relationship between the Westerlands and the Dragon Riders. Which brings us briefly back to ancient times. We know the Valerians are a race of purple-eyed, silver-gold, or platinum-white-haired people that rose to power on Valeria and built their mighty freehold in this area. While not all Valerians were Dragon Riders, those that were, the Dragon Lords, ruled Valeria. The Valerians had an insatiable hunger for wealth and precious resources, including precious metals. This hunger led to war, enslavement of others, and many horrendous acts. However, despite this unending need for resources, they never went after the Westerlands. This is odd as the Lannisters had tons of gold and silver mines, ore and more. No mines in the world were as rich as those in the Westerlands. Some mines in the Westerlands had been utilized for a thousand years and still hadn't run dry. The Westerlands wealth was so well known that as far as a shy, merchants would ask travelers from the Seven Kingdoms if it were true that the Lion Lord lived in a palace of solid gold and if they could really plow their fields and obtain gold from it. So if this reputation was known as far as Essos, why didn't the Dragon Lord seek to take this wealth? That's a huge temptation. Or maybe even make a deal with the Lannisters much sooner for some precious material. Surely the dragon ride over wouldn't be that hard. They have flown and attacked some impressive distances before. And done some really fucked up things in order to get wealth. Let's not forget that one. Yet according to Maesters, there is no evidence the Dragon Lords ever made contact with the Lords of Casterly Rock. There are two thoughts on why the Valerians did not strike the Westerlands or visit for trade. The first thought comes from an Archmaester who suggests the Valerians had actually reached as far as Old Town in ancient days and attacked. However, during this attack, they either suffered a tragedy or event that made them turn back and shun all of Westeros until the Targaryens. The next idea explaining the absence of the Valerians from the Westerlands is a lot more fun, but the Maesters believe is less likely, which means it's probably absolutely true. Septon Barth, a common-born Septon with a brilliant mind that died in 99 AC, referred to a Valerian text that has been lost in current A Song of Ice and Fire time. In the text, it suggests that the Freehold sorcerers foretold that the gold of Casterly Rock would destroy them. Fearing this prophecy, the Freehold steered clear of the Westerlands and the bounty it contained. 
Perhaps if it wasn't for that prophecy, the Valerians may have tried to attack or sell a sword to them sooner. Whether the prophecy kept them away or not can't be said for certain, but something changed around 200 BC. Negotiations took place and the Lannisters paid enough gold to raise an army for one Valerian steel sword they named Bright Roar. As it is stated they overpaid by a lot, it leads some to believe that this was because the Valerians wanted nothing to do with the Lannisters or their gold, fearing the prophecy. But finally the Lannisters made a deal one Valerian family just couldn't resist. And if you want to get really tinfoily, some believe it was a Valerian family that wanted the money to pay faceless men to kill the other ruling Valerian families so they could be the most powerful. Which would make sense because the main families of the Freehold of Valeria were constantly in a power struggle. And honestly, it sounded like nonstop drama over there between them. So it wouldn't be shocking to discover. Some theorize the murder of these families by the faceless men bought with the gold from the Lannisters caused the doom. Some maesters believe that the families and their magic slash spells kept the 14 flames, an immense chain of volcanoes on their peninsula, stable. As the families were taken out, the 14 flames became unstable and eventually the spells failed to contain them, leading directly to the utter devastation of the Doom of Valeria. It is fairly interesting that the prophecy said Lannister gold would cause the Doom of Valeria and about 100 years after the Lannisters may have given some Valerian a shit ton of gold, the majority of them are wiped out. But that's a stretch, so let's go back to the sword and away from tinfoil for now. So again, after giving the Valerians enough gold to raise an army, they finally had Bright Roar. While we don't have an official description of the sword, we do have an image approved by George that was placed in the World of Ice and Fire book. The sword pictured has a roaring lion for a pummel and has the typical Valerian steel look, a rippled pattern from the mark of steel that has been folded back on itself thousands of times. And though not directly stated, we can guess their sword saw battle more than a few times. If you're gonna pay that much for a sword, especially as a status symbol, you want to take it out from time to time and show it off. We know at the Battle of Land's Point, Lancel IV beheaded the Ironborn King, Harold Halfdrown, and his heir with a single stroke of bright roar. But much else of its use is unknown, except for it was in the Lannisters' possession. This all changed a little more than a century after they acquired it. King Tommen II, in his greed, decided he would sail a fleet to the ruins of Valeria, where he would plunder the wealth and sorcery he was convinced still remained there. Taking Bright Roar with him, he set sail. All was going well when he reached the city of Volantis in Essos, an ideal stop to get supplies before heading to Valeria, given the location and closeness to the area. When the Triarchs of the city saw the Golden Fleet burying the Lion King, they lavished him with gifts. According to the city's history books, the Triarchs were super excited to see a king from Westeros in all his glory. Though we don't have any of Tom and the Second's men to confirm this, the Volantian Chronicle called the Glory of Volantis states that as Tommen and his fleet stayed for supplies and enjoyed the generosity of the Triarchs, he made promises to give half of all he found in Valeria to them, and in return, the Triarchs promised to send their fleet to aid him when requested. By the book's account, both King Tommen and the Triarchs liked each other and wanted to help each other out. After gifts and promises, the king sailed to Valeria to find its treasures, and Tommen, his fleet, and Bright Roar were never seen again. And not for lack of looking. A year later, again according to the history books of Volantis, the Triarch Tagoros sent a squadron of ships towards Valeria to see if any sign of the fleet could be found. They returned with no information on Tommen or his men. This of course didn't sit well with the Lannisters. They were always a prideful house, and the fact they no longer had a family Valerian steel sword burned. Though I'm sure other Lannisters probably thought of finding their family heirloom, it wasn't until 291 AC that Tywin's brother, Jerrion, decided he was going to find it. With this declaration, Tyrion, who was 18 years old at the time, begged his father to let him go with his uncle to find the sword, but Tywin refused. It turned out it was a good thing Tywin had refused to let Tyrion go with his uncle on his quest to find Bright Roar and other treasures of Valeria, as after a decade, Jerrion never returned with his ship, the Laughing Lion. Tywin, despite his stormy relationship with his younger brother, sent men to look for him and traced him to Volantis, where half Jerrion's crew had abandoned him when he decided to sail into the Smoking Sea, 
a place where the sea is flooded into the shattered remains of the Valerian Peninsula post the doom of Valeria. Water is said to boil in places and be haunted by demons and krakens. So I'd probably abandon him too. With half his crew leaving him, Jirion was forced to buy slaves to replace them and finally sailed out. Whatever happened next is unknown, and sadly, Tywin never found his brother. Speaking of Tywin, not being able to find Bright Roar, he went for another option, buying another family sword to make it his family's. To that end, Tywin attempted to buy the Valerian Steel Swords from other houses. Yet all the times he offered to buy Valerian Swords from an impoverished lesser house, he had been told no. At least three times Tywin learned that even poor lords cherished their old family swords while they would gladly part with their daughters should a Lannister ask. Though Tywin did finally get two Valerian steel swords for his family when he had ice melted down. So, I guess good for you, Tywin. So where is Bright Roar and will we ever see it again? Well, chances are Bright Roar is simply at the bottom of the sea around Valeria, perhaps in the smoking sea to never be seen again, with it being missing only to add to Tywin's desire to melt down ice. But simple answers are no fun, and eh, I'd say often boring, so let's look at some tinfoil. One of my favorite theories is foul play by the people of Volantis. These guys already aren't the nicest people. They have a huge slave trade and are incredibly racist. There is a theory that the Triarchs have killed those that attempt to explore or take the treasures of Valeria. Being so close to that location, they already know what is there and or they believe the treasures of Valeria are their birthright. Which sure sounds like what they were mouthing off about centuries ago. So the thought is, when Tommen II visited, the Triarchs immediately began to feast him to see his intent. When they learned he was to go to Valeria, they killed Tommen and his men and took the gold and supplies for their own. Or maybe killed him while at sea, away from the city for fewer witnesses. The same thing happened when Jerrion planned on finding the sword. He hit Volantis, they learned of his plan, killed him and his crew, and took his gold and supplies. It is interesting we have to go by the word of the history books of Volantis on the mysterious disappearance of each Lannister. To expand on this, it is believed when Danny, with Tyrion beside her in the books, goes to wreck Volantis, Tyrion will find his family's sword in a treasure room in Volantis. He didn't get to go with his uncle Jirion like he begged his father to do, but in the end he found what his uncle had sought, their family sword. However, what if this is just paranoid talk? I'm throwing a lot of shade at the poor people of Volantis. Let's say Tom II did get to the waters around Valeria, ran into problems, and his ship sank. Then we'll likely never see the sword again. Or what if he was attacked by pirates near Valeria and his stuff was taken? So now some rando has Bright Roar, which isn't as fun and kind of makes me sad. But what if he did make it to Valeria and he died there? That could mean the sword is in the ruins of Valeria. Again, Danny could take a pit stop there, I mean, why the fuck not? She seems to really like chilling in Essos, and find the family sword. Now the more paranoid among us think that when Euron went to Valeria, he actually encountered Jirion returning with the sword and other treasures, killed him, and took it all for himself. While the timing does seem off, given when Tywin finally wanted to send for help or to search for Jirion, it could work out. If you get squinty with it. Real squinty. So what are your theories on Bright Roar? Where do you think it currently is? Do you think the sword will ever matter? Let me know your thoughts down below. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and come back for more videos.